This video is sponsored by Simply Safe. The Corolla has gone from being the quintessential economy car to being the Hachiroku to an economy car again, then kind of a fun car, then an economy car that just kind of looked fun, to now, its ultimate form. This is the most hardcore Corolla there ever has been and maybe ever will be, and is proof positive that the Corolla has an identity crisis. So let's take a look at the history of Toyota's best-selling car of all time, so we can understand how a car can go from being your grandma's daily driver to a fire-breathing rally machine. I'm Guff. I'm Zane. This is Albon. Let's, let's get, get started. started. 1966, Toyota was on a roll. They had the Crown, the Corona, the Publica, and they had just taken the wraps off the legendary 2000 GT. But there was a problem. Cars like the Crown and the 2000 GT were nice, too nice. And companies like Datsun and Subaru were bringing out affordable, compact cars for families buying their first automobile. Toyota knew they needed to get in on this market. And so they began development of the KE1X chassis. It was to be a small sedan and coupe platform powered by an inline four engine driving the rear wheels. And when I mean small, it had a wheelbase of 90 inches. Now the Datsun 1000 and Subaru 1000 were basically the same thing. So Toyota needed an X factor, an edge Edge over the competition. That edge was 77 cubic centimeters. The inline four K series engine from Toyota was 1,077 cc, making it classed as a 1.1 liter engine. The Datsun and Subaru, well, they were called 1,000 for a reason. And that extra 0.1 liter of engine in the Toyota became its headlining feature. Sure, it only made 50 odd horsepower, but it was still more. Toyota doubled down on this engine and even had an ad campaign called the 100 cc advantage. And that, combined with the four-speed manual and McPherson strut front suspension, made for a zippy little runabout for the 1960s. The Japanese public loved them too, and were no doubt flexing on all their Datsun driving friends with their big block 1.1 liter engine. A sportier version called the Sprinter was sold alongside the Corolla in Japan, and it was just as much of a hit. And in 1968, the Corolla even made its way to North America, now sporting a facelift. And there began the Corolla's journey of world domination. In 1970, the second generation E20 model brought bubblier styling and the new 1.4 liter Toyota T engine in select models. The ones to get though were the new Corolla 11 or Sprinter Trueno versions. These rocked a 1.6 liter dual overhead cam Toyota 2TG engine and they made 125 horsepower in top spec with twin side drive Mikuni carbs. Add to that a wider body, quicker steering rack and manual brakes for excellent driving feel and you've got yourself quite a sporty little car. It seemed that Toyota wasn't afraid to dip their toe into the sports car waters, even with an economy car like the Corolla. And the 11 and Trueno models were the perfect alter egos for the Corolla to have some fun with. Like clockwork, there was a facelift two years later and then a whole new generation in four. This new generation was the E30 Corolla. And well, this one may have been the most important one yet. In 1973, a little something called the oil crisis happened. Basically, OPEC created an oil embargo to choke oil supplies to countries that backed Israel in the Yom Kippur War. The price of a barrel of oil, most notably in the US, climbed three 300% over the next year. This might all sound a little too familiar. Anyways, pricey oil meant that American land yachts with thirsty V8s were quickly falling out of favor, and small, fuel-efficient four-cylinder cars became all the rage. The E30 Corolla launched with one goal and one goal only, become the quintessential economy car. And thanks to the fuel-sipping 3K and 2T engines, the Corolla did just that. That same year, 1974, the Corolla became the best-selling car in the world. Yes, a cheap little Toyota economy car. One that only had eight years of experience under its belt, outsold every single other car on God's green earth. The thing is though, the E30 might have been great on gas, but it was pretty much mediocre otherwise. Road and Track said it was heavy and expensive compared to the Honda Civic. And they complained that the rear suspension was crude compared to the Volkswagen Rabbit. And they weren't the only ones saying this. You see, the chief engineer of the next generation Corolla, Fumio Agetsuma, was on a business trip to the Netherlands. And on that trip, one of his colleagues mentioned that he would never buy a Corolla because the suspension was as bad as a 19th century horse-drawn carriage. Understandably, Agetsuma-san was pretty pissed. And that was apparently one of the big motivating factors that led him to revamp the next generation E70 Corolla. Released in 1979, the E70 Corolla was focused on refinement. Just like our sponsor, Simply Say. It seems no matter how many 10mm sockets I buy, they always disappear. At first I thought I was just being careless, but 
then I realized there was something nefarious afoot. I needed security, and I needed the best. I needed Simply Safe. Simply Safe is a security system that protects you 24/7. Every door, every room, every window, and it's backed by professional monitoring that will dispatch police, firefighters, or EMTs as soon as they're needed. Installation is simple with an easy-to-use base station that wirelessly connects to your keypad, door sensors, cameras, and more. And now, not only am I protected, but so are my precious 10 millimeter socket. Simply Safe is less than a dollar a day, and there are never any long-term contracts. If you visit simplysafe.com/albon, you can save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan. And on top of that, you get your first month for free. So head over to simplysafe.com/albon or hit the link in the description to protect your home or business. Now back to the video. The wheelbase was lengthened by four and a half inches. The new 3T engine was smoother and more powerful than the outgoing 2T engine. And the big change was a full overhaul of the rear suspension. No more horse-drawn carriage here. This time, the Corolla had a five-link rear end, complete with coil springs and a panhard bar. And all this resulted in a car that was quieter, more comfortable, and dynamically far superior to the previous gen. Plus, the Sport 11 and Trueno models were available with the all-new 4A engine, which in combination with the new chassis and suspension made for a car that was as fitting on the toge as it was on the daily drive. And many racing teams even use this Corolla as a cheap, reliable rear-wheel drive platform to build racing cars off of. Agitsuma-san had found a way to give the Corolla a dual personality, quiet and unassuming, yet raw and fun when it needed to be. By 1980, daily Corolla production hit an all-time high, 2,346 cars every single day. And by 1983, Toyota had sold their one millionth Corolla. And it made sense. It had something for everyone at a price that anyone could afford. And it truly seemed like the little Corolla just couldn't be stopped. Well, that is, until the mid 80s. You see, the E70 Corolla was still rear-wheel drive in an era where almost every manufacturer was switching to cheaper, easier to make front-wheel drive. And for Toyota, it only made sense for them to follow suit, to further cut costs and to use space more efficiently. But going front-wheel drive meant the Corolla would be taking a big step back dynamically. Front-wheel drive cars like the Honda Civic and the Nissan Sunny just didn't drive the same as a rear-drive Corolla. And for the engineers at Toyota, it was a decision that necessitated some pushback against the executives. They argued that Toyota already produced a front-wheel drive car, the Toyota Tercel. And while that car did well in the United States, in their home market of Japan, the little Tercel just wasn't a match for the mighty Corolla. And so the bean counters won. The rear drive Corolla was to be transitioned to a fully front wheel drive platform. But Agatsuma-san had one less car to play against the Toyota top brass. You see, converting the existing Corolla factories from producing rear wheel drive cars to front wheel drive will cost too much money to justify a drastic switch. So he came up with a compromise. The Corolla was to be built with both the latest technologies and cost cuttings alongside the existing factory equipment, meaning some E80 Corolla Corollas would transition to front-wheel drive, while others remained rear-wheel drive. The front-wheel drive cars were fine, mostly just boring 60 to 80 horsepower little sedans and hatchbacks, with the only notable version being the FX16 Corolla hatch. But the rear-wheel drive car? Well, that's where all the magic happened. Enter the AE85 and AE86 Corollas. These were technically based on the previous gen E70 platform, but upgraded with more modern tech. The AE85 model used Toyota's 3AU single overhead cam Carby engine, and it made about 85 horsepower. But the engineers, they weren't content with this. They had fought tooth and nail to keep the Corolla rear wheel drive, and they needed to give it a proper send off. So a super team of engineers was formed. And on that super team was Nobuaki Katayama, a man that later went on to become one of the lead engineers on the Mark IV Supra. Katayama-san and his team built on that E70 platform and created the AE86, AKA the Hachiroku. Now, you already know this car, you have to, but why? It isn't by coincidence. This car became truly legendary. The Hachiroku, or 86, came with the notorious, naturally aspirated 4AGE dual overhead cam engine, an engine that was co-developed with Yamaha. And while the 4AGE might seem like an ordinary four banger today, in 1983, it was far ahead of its time. The engine had four valves per cylinder, as opposed to just two like the other Corolla, and as a result, could sing to 7,800 RPM. On top of that, the AE86 was 
lightweight, it had an optional LSD, and had damn near 50-50 weight distribution. All the ingredients for a perfect driver's car. Katayama-san and his team did not compromise. And after the car was released, drivers like Keiichi Tsuchiya, the Drift King, lifted the AE86's pedigree to new heights. When Keiichi Tsuchiya was a rookie racer, most of the grid came from money or racing backgrounds. But Tsuchiya? Oh no. He came from street and toge racing, and his car of choice since the 80s, the AE86 Corolla. And Tsuchiya was so fast on track that to keep spectators from getting bored of him winning all the time, he would start drifting his car through the corner. People loved his little drifting stints so much that in 1987, he got funding to film a showcase video in which he drifted his 86 around a toge. This was the first drifting video of its kind ever, and of course, it was in a freaking Corolla. He got his pro racing license suspended because of that movie, but that's besides the point. The AE86 Corolla was now legendary. Years later, there was also the Initial D manga and anime that took the car to even greater heights. And yes, Tsuchiya was consulted on the show to assist with the technical accuracy of vehicle behavior. Thus, the AE86 Corolla, to this day, is heralded as the OG drift car. A car whose DNA still exists in cars of the modern era. And you can thank the engineers at Toyota and Yamaha who spilled their hearts into that car to make sure that Toyota couldn't abandon that Corolla ethos. But it seemed the wishes of the engineers couldn't last. And in 1987, the E80 was retired for the E90 Corolla, which was totally front wheel drive based. And to add insult to injury, this was probably the ugliest Corolla they made yet. But hey, it wasn't all bad. The E90 still sported the venerable 4A GE engine from the Hachi and in Japan, they even offered the Corolla GTZ with a 160 horsepower supercharged 4A GZE. But if I'm being honest, from enthusiast perspective, the Corolla was just treading water. The driver's choice was still the old 86, and most people saw the latest Corolla as nothing more than the boring family car it was designed to be. If you wanted a fun modern Toyota, you bought the Celica GT4 or paid the premium and got the Supra. And in 1991, when we got the E100 generation, it was much the same. Well, except for one model. In 1994, Toyota Racing Development unveiled something they've been working on deep in their secret labs. It was called the Toyota TRD 2000, and it was a Corolla GT sedan that was souped up to look like the 1994 Japan Touring Car Championship Corolla. But it wasn't just race car looks. The old A-Series engine was swapped out for the newly developed Yamaha built 3SGE, making nearly 180 horsepower, hooked up to a new 5-speed manual with limited slip diff, sticky tires, lowered suspension, and big brakes to boot. Of course, race car performance means race car prices. And this Corolla cost 3.3 million yen, or over 61,000 US dollars in today's money. That was double the price of a standard Corolla. As you might imagine, they didn't make very many of them. The plan was to build 99 TRD 2000 Corollas. They sold 10, which might actually make it the rarest Corolla on the planet. Anyways, the standard E100 Corollas were pretty much business as usual. But in 1995, it was finally replaced with the E110. These 8th generation cars ditched the A-Series engine for a all-new, all-aluminum 1ZZ engine in most markets. But other than the AE111 Sprinter and its 4AGE 20-valve blacktop, there wasn't much else going on with this generation of Corolla. They did race the Corolla in World Rally though, with the Corolla WRC. It was a fire-breathing, 300 horsepower, turbo, all-wheel drive rocket powered by the 3S GTE. But it was mostly a product of necessity. The Celica GT4 had just been banned from WRC because of an illegal modification. And so the drivetrain was essentially transplanted into the Corolla as a Hail Mary effort to get back on track. Turns out though, the Corolla did great. It ended up winning four events and taking the 1999 manufacturer's title. Of course, there was never a road car version of it. So the 20 valve powered Sprinter was the best we got. The next gen E120 continued the tradition of boringness. Again, except for one model. The engineers decided to take the Yamaha built, high revving, naturally aspirated 2ZZ GE and stick it into Corollas all around the planet. By the way, we just did a video on Yamaha and all their cool engines, so check that out later. In North America, it was called the Corolla XRS and it had the full Celica GTS drivetrain in it making 170 horsepower. And they even did a Matrix XRS as well. You know, it was interesting. Nine generations in, it seemed like no matter how boring the base Corolla was, there were always a few influential engineers at Toyota that wanted to keep that driving spirit alive. Sure, the Corolla was an economy car first, nobody doubted that, but it felt nice that there was always an enthusiast flavor available in the cheap, practical sedan market. Well, 
until the E140 generation. In 2006, the 10th gen Corolla came out and it was slow, boring, and fat. Seriously, the export market cars were called the E140 wide because they were fattened up versions for a ever fattening demographic. And I'll be honest, there wasn't much redeeming about the E140. They sold like crazy because they were great economy cars, but they were an embodiment of how bland Toyota had become in the mid 2000s. No sports cars on sale, not even a cheeky fun version of their basic grocery getters. The 11th gen E160 and E170 models were pretty boring too. They got bigger and fatter, a little bit more fuel efficient, but overall forgettable. And it made sense considering how globalized the Corolla had become. At this point, it was manufactured in Vietnam, Venezuela, the US, Turkey, Thailand, Taiwan, South Africa, Pakistan, India, China, Canada, and Brazil. Yes, they were making so many Corollas that they needed 12 factories around the planet to keep up with demand. And that brings us to 2018, when the current generation E210 Corolla was introduced. This time, the car was built on Toyota's all new GAC global architecture. And new common underpinning for cars like the Corolla, Prius, and CHR. One that promised to be lighter, stiffer, and more versatile than previous generations. It came in all sorts of different flavors. Front wheel drive, all wheel drive, petrol, diesel, hybrid, pretty much anything but sporty. There was the Corolla hatchback, which was available with the 2 liter M20A inline 4, making 169 horsepower and a 6 speed manual. But while it certainly looked the part, it didn't drive as fast as it looked. Even with the later Apex edition, a call back to the AE86 Corolla Apex, the upgraded suspension, bigger sway bars, and cool wheels didn't do much. The current gen Toyota GR86 already laid claim to the Hachiroko legacy. Hell, it even took its name. And the Corolla was left behind, a model that was too far gone, too much of an economy car. And while it was great at being a reliable, efficient daily driver, any attempts at making this a driver's car was simply lipstick on the proverbial pig. But it turns out there was something brewing overseas. Something that seemed like it had nothing to do with the Corolla. You see, Gazoo Racing, Toyota's Skunk Works race car division, had been hard at work developing a fully homologated version of their rally car led by chief engineer Naohiko Saito. It was based on the Toyota Yaris, a car that they had stopped selling in the US in 2018. But it turns out it wasn't all Yaris. You see, the standard Yaris road car had pretty crap rear suspension. But you know what didn't? The Corolla. And so Saito-san and the Gazoo Racing team took the rear half of the GAC Corolla architecture with its much improved multi-link rear suspension layout and grafted it to the back of a Yaris. Then they developed an all new 1.6 liter three cylinder engine and an advanced electronically controlled all wheel drive system called GR4. And then they took it rally racing. Now we did a full video on the Yaris WRC, so I'll spare you the details. But what's important is that it resulted in a road car called the GR Yaris. And that car set the world on fire. Every journalist on the planet seemed to proclaim that the GR Yaris was the best thing since Kanye's graduation album. It was the hottest of hot hatches and laid a smackdown on cars like the Volkswagen Golf and the Honda Civic. Once again, it was good leadership and a chief engineer that was willing to break the trend that led to the creation of another fantastic sports car at Toyota. And even beyond that, the CEO, Akio Toyota, was heavily involved in the development process, driving and testing the cars at every stage, ensuring that the project was heading in the right direction. The GR Yaris project brought back memories of the AE86 nearly 40 years prior, an engineer's valiant fight against the status quo, a fight to put the enthusiast first for once, even when it wasn't profitable. But guess what? It wasn't available in North America. Even Mexico got a limited 300 car run of them, but sadly, us Americans were out of luck. We didn't get the Yaris here. It was discontinued. And to go through the process of reintroducing the Yaris to our market for a low volume car like this was infeasible for Toyota. Enter the engineers. Gazoo Racing, now led by chief engineer Naoyuki Sakamoto, decided to take on another secret project. The goal was simple, bring the magic of the GR Yaris to the markets that didn't get it, namely North America. And since the Yaris was out of the question, what else to start with than the humble Corolla? But the base Corolla, much like the base Yaris, was pretty bland. And so the car needed some serious work to live up to their engineering goals. First, 
the chassis was stiffened with hundreds of additional weld points and over 2.7 meters of structural adhesive. Then the body was widened at all four corners with the track width widened as well. The 1.6 liter three cylinder turbo engine was given new pistons and the boost was upped by 10%, resulting in a roughly 40 horsepower increase over the Yaris. The GR4 all wheel drive system was carried over largely unchanged, but this time with more aggressive final drives in the differentials to keep the car peppy despite the added weight. And that might be the biggest question mark of this whole project, the weight. This new GR Corolla tips the scales at a whopping 427 pounds more than the GR Yaris. And while it may not be a heavy car in this day and age, that much added weight could be the difference between it being a proper rally hot hatch or yet another underpowered, oversprung, understeering pig of a car. Of course, none of us know we haven't driven it yet. But after having a conversation with Sakamoto-san, I have high hopes. Because just like with Agetsuma-san and the E70, or Katayama-san and the AE86, or Saito-san with the GR Yaris, the GR Corolla seems like it's in good hands. A passionate team of gearheads led by an enthusiast chief engineer. One who will finally let the Corolla shed its economy car personality yet again and become the badass sports car that it was always capable of being. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please be sure to press like and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the upcoming GR Corolla. Subscribe if you haven't already and we'll see you in the next one.